Welcome to the first of this academic year's Modern War Institute Speaker Series. It is my honor to introduce our first guest speaker, Dr. Sean McFate. Dr. McFate is an author, a novelist, and a foreign policy expert. He's a professor of strategy at the National Defense University and Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service in Washington, D.C. Additionally, he's an advisor to Oxford University's Center for Technology and Global Affairs. Dr. McFate's career began as a paratrooper and officer in the Army's storied 82nd Airborne Division, where he worked for some people you might have heard of named McChrystal and Petraeus. Following his military service, Dr. McFate became a private military contractor, where among, among his many experiences, he dealt with warlords, raised armies for U.S. interests, rode with armed groups in the Sahara, conducted strategic reconnaissance for oil companies, transacted arms deals in Eastern Europe, and helped prevent an impending genocide in the Rwanda region. You are an international man of mystery there, Sean. <laughs> Dr. Murphy has authored or co-authored several books, including The New Rules of War, Victory in the Age of Durable Disorder, The Modern Mercenary, Private Armies and What, and, and what They Mean for World Order, and works of fiction, including Shadow War and Deep Black. Dr. McFaid has also written for the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, The New Republic, Foreign Policy, Politico, Daily Beast, CNBC, Vice Magazine, Eon, War on the Rocks, Military Review, and African Affairs. He's appeared on CNN's Amapur, MSNBC's Morning Joe, Fox and Friends, NPR, BBC, Economist, HBO, The Discovery Channel, and the American Harris Channel. Dr. McFade holds a BA from Brown University, an MPP from Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and a PhD in international relations from the London School of Economics and uh, political science. He lives in DC. Please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. McFay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for making time today. Uh, some of you may or may not know, I, my, uh, I also write a lot of fiction, I write a lot of novels. And everything that doesn't go into the nonfiction finds its way into the fiction. Fiction is a great way to talk about modern war. Uh, and for those of you looking for a third, fourth, or fifth career, not many people can write nonfiction and fiction, so I'll tell you the secret. If you want to write good nonfiction, you have to get up early in the morning and drink lots of coffee. For good fiction, late at night with lots of scotch. I'm sure cadets here probably don't have the opportunity to write much fiction in their spare time. Uh, not yet. Um, so I, as you know, was an Army officer, 82nd Airborne Paratrooper, um, and I wrote this book because I was angry. Uh, the New Rules of War, which is also called Goliath in the UK and in Europe, it has a different title, different cover. Um, that is a choice made by editors and not by authors. Uh, they're the same book, more or less. But I wrote these books because I was angry. I was angry because, like some of you, I have lost good friends in Iraq and Afghanistan. As a taxpayer, it sickens me to see trillions of dollars spent in those places with little to show for it, in my opinion. And as a vet, it is hateful to me to see American international honor tarnished by low-level foes. Right? And the mystery, though, is this. We have the best military in the world. Even our adversaries know this. We have the best troops, the best training, the best technology, the most money. Our military has more, mil has more money than the next eight biggest militaries in the world combined. Combined. So what's the problem? And that's the central question of this book. What is the problem? Sorry. What, and this is what the book has tries to answer. And the, bo the problem, bottom line up front, is this, is that warfare has moved on, but we have not moved with it. Warfare has moved on, but we have not moved on with it. Our enemies grasp this, and they've moved on. And that's why we struggle. And this book tries to answer, how do we catch up? by offering 10 new rules, ideas, principles, whatever you want to call it, two new, 10 new principles for how modern and future wars will be fought, all right? 
Now, you, why, don't, why haven't we moved on? You've heard the adage that generals always fight the last war. Well, this adage happens to be true. It's a truism that happens to be true. And what it really means is that generals always fight the last successful war. So when you go to like Washington, D.C., has all these think tank meetings about the future of war. It's a hot topic right now. And normally what it is, it's World War II with better technology. World War II with better technology, the failure to innovate. Think of what did France think the future of war would be after World War I. They thought it'd be like the last war that they won, trench warfare. So what did they invest in? The Maginot Line, the greatest trench system in the world. But war had moved on, and they got blitzkrieged. So in truth, when most, what most futurists see is this. They think they're looking forward, but in reality, they're looking in the rear view mirror. And that gets people killed. And that's why I wrote this book. Case study. Who here has heard of Billy Mitchell? Has anybody heard of Billy Mitchell? Air Force guy, of course. Uh, Billy Mitchell was an army aviator in World War I. Uh, and he had something what I call Cassandra's curse. You know Cassandra? Cassandra was a, a woman from Greek mythology. She had the gift of foresight, but had the curse that nobody would believe her. And that's what war prophets are, like Billy Mitchell. He was an army aviator in World War I, and he saw the future of war. And it was air power, air power. And when he came back to Washington, uh, after World War I was done, as a, he was a one star, he told all, everybody, all his colleagues, the future is air power, we must invest in air power. And they were like, no, 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 Billy, that's not the future of war. What do you think they thought the future of war was in 1920? Tanks, some of them, most of them did not see tanks. Most people saw tanks as mobile foxholes. They were infantry support vehicles. They weren't, you know, they weren't, a, they weren't at Blitzkrieg yet. How did people think of, uh, uh, what do they think the future war would be? Battleships. Battleships, part of it, yeah. They thought it'd be like trench warfare. They thought it'd be the Maginot Line, right? And he said, no, 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 to your point, this airplane can, will sink a battleship. And when he said that, what do you think the reaction was? Less laughter, laughter, Mitchell got off the stage. Because when he said that in the early 20s, this was little more than a motorized kite in the era of the super dreadnought. And like, that's nuts. But Mitchell had some backbone and some wasta, and he convinced the Department of Navy to pull out a dreadnought, a captured German battleship, into the Chesapeake. And he did this. He sank it. OK, now what happens, do you think? No spoilers over here. No spoilers. What, what, what happens, do you think? Is this proof of concept? Let's think about this, Mitchell. No, this became a huge controversy that spilled out into the national papers in a pre-Twitter age, if you can imagine that. And um, basically, there's this huge debate. Some saying, Mitchell, that proves nothing. That's not wartime conditions. That's an unarmed, you know, unmanned, anchored ship in the, in the, you know, in the Chesapeake Bay. So what that you sank it? That's not wartime. And he's like, no, that's not the point. The point is an airplane sank a battleship. That's the point. Let's start from there. And this got to grew to be bigger and bigger. And General Pershing, who was then the chief of staff, uh, perhaps to save Mitchell's career, said, hey, Billy, come over here. I think you need to leave town for just a little bit until it settles down. So in DOD fashion, he sent Mitchell on a one-year cruise of the Pacific to get him out of town, get him out of town. Now when Mitchell comes back, he comes back with a, a report this thick. Now of course the, the debate has died down, he's out of town, comes back with a report this thick. In this report about the Pacific, uh, he says this, at 7.30 in the morning, on a Sunday morning at 7.30, the Japanese will launch a sneak attack against Pearl Harbor using airplanes. Airplanes. He said this in 1924. 
Now what happens? What happens now? What's Cassandra's curse? Not only that, not only then we listen to him, it goes beyond that. He gets, he gets court-martialed at Fort McNair in Washington, D.C. And this isn't some regular court-martial. This is like a Kim Kardashian court-martial. It's a crazy court-martial in the press, all over the place, all sorts of problems and shenanigans. He is defrocked. He says, screw it. I'm out. I'm out of the military. And he spends the last few years of his life going across the nation to anybody who would listen to him about the future of war, the future of war is aviation, the future of war is aviation. People would show up to listen to the old kook. They didn't take him very seriously. And he died a bitter man in the 1930s. And then we know how this ends, right? We know how this ends. And the US military said they were caught completely by surprise, even though one of their own called it 15 years prior. Right? Now, this is Cassandra's curse. Victorious nations are reluctant to change the way they fight. Sometimes it's easier to court-martial new ideas and listen to them. And the military, in its way, made up to Mitchell and named a bomber after him, the B-25 bomber, the only American bomber named after a person in World War II. Not exactly an apology, but something close to it. So the book, The New Rules of War, asks this question. You know, are we facing a Billy Mitchell moment today? Are we facing a Billy Mitchell moment today? Because even an undefeated military can lose. The French built a Maginot line to see it useless as war moved forward, and they did not. Are we building a Maginot line today? strategically. Now, if I was to ask you, what are our biggest threats today, we could spend all afternoon on this question, right? We could, we, we'd have the normal panoply of bad actors, you know, China, Russia, Iran, some ISIS future. Um, we also have narcos. We have failed states like Venezuela. Uh, we have climate change, you name it, right? All sorts of things. Now, as bad as these all are, in this book, I argue that they are not the worst. They are, there's an even bigger threat out there that they either exploit or they get an unwitting bump from. And this is a systemic threat, something I called durable disorder. What is durable disorder? Disorder is something that they can use or they benefit from, whether they know it or not. Durable disorder is what is left. It's a new type of world order. Actually, it's a very old one. It's what's left as the Westphalian system of nation states retreats around the world. It's what's left in the wake. Think of like Syria or Somalia or Africa or Iraq. As state sort of power leaves, it's what fills in the vacuum. Now, this is not. Uh, this, so the world's going away from sort of a nation state thing. We've known this for 25 years. Nation states are retreating everywhere. It's what's left in the wake. Now, it doesn't, it's not anarchy. It is not, uh, you know, the sky is falling, invest in more sky. It's not the dark ages and the Knights of Knee. Uh, what it is, is it's, it's sort of persistent conflict. Conflicts that don't end. Conflicts that don't resolve. We have overlapping authorities that may not be state-like. Right? But there is governance in places like Somalia. It just doesn't fly a flag. It can contain problems but not solve them. Key difference. It can contain problems but not solve them. It is a systemic threat, disorder, and it is not new. The important thing is it's not new. This is the type of world order that, say, Machiavelli was writing about. If you think about the prince, and we was talking about, and the Italian wars, the era of the Middle Ages, or even antiquity, the idea that the world that we learned about in sixth grade, that nation states rule the world and only the national armies fight legitimately, that is ahistorical. That's not what military history teaches us if you look at it. 
states, West, modern European Westphalian states are only about three to 400 years old. National armies are only about that old as well. In fact, nobody had national armies. They fought with mercenaries for the most part. There's some exceptions, but mostly private, you know, mercenaries are the second oldest profession. And that changes, when you privatize war, it changes warfare in profound ways, in ways that we've forgotten. That world is now returning to us, as well as everything else. So here's some signs of durable disorder today. Half of all peace deals fail in five years. Think about that with Afghanistan, okay? The majority of states in the world are fragile or failed by any measure. When we talk about states, people always think about the top 30, not the bottom 160, many of which are just states in name only or just regimes in states. We're seeing mercenaries return, and not the lone guys with Kalashnikovs in the Congo. We're seeing you can rent special operations forces. You can, you can rent MI-24 attack hind helicopters, as Nigeria did in 2015 to take care of Boko Haram secretly, and they did. The military of Nigeria could not deal with Boko Haram for six years, and they're not a small military. They hired mercenaries to search and destroy, and they did in weeks. Um, we're seeing this type of world come back. We're going back to the status quo ante of a pre-Westphalian era. So moving forward here, those who understand how the world order is changing it can exploit it. Russia, China, others, Iran. Those who do not will be exploited. This is one of the puzzle pieces for why the US struggles, in my opinion, strategically. US foreign policy looks like this. It's trying to put back together Humpty Dumpty of a liberal international order. Now, the question is, what is the liberal international order, and did it ever really exist? That's one question. The second is, if it does exist, is it feasible to re-implement it globally? It's another question, right? That's kind of what foreign policy looks like, regardless of who is sitting in the White House, is re-establish international order. Whereas you have, you know, some would say revisionist powers saying, you know, we don't want that. We're going to do, we're going to do it in a different way, whether it's Al-Qaeda or China or Russia or whomever, you know? So we struggle because we have, I, in my opinion, we need a grand strategy for durable disorder, not a grand strategy to repeat a world that we would like to go back to. So a new kind of world order, a new kind of world environment begets a new type of warfare. And that's what this book explains. What does this new type of warfare look like? How do you fight and win in this new global environment that's changed war? What works in war? What does not work in war? And the new rules of war explain this. Now, this is the national defense strategy that came out last year, right? In it, it says disorder is a threat. And I know many of the authors behind this document, and they're, they're sophisticated, they're savvy. And they said that we are shifting now to an era of great power competition. Now, when they wrote that, that's not what, how it's being read is different than how it was written. You've heard this like intent versus impact. Can you communicate, right? The way this is being read widely around Washington, D.C. right now is great power competition is coming back. That means, who does it mean? And who else? Means these two guys, right? Means these two guys. And, and everybody's gearing up for the next fight against this. I like to say that budgets are moral documents because they do not lie, right? If you look at the Department of Defense's palm, it's almost entirely conventional war weapons. Conventional war weapons. Our Maginot line. Why does everybody assume a fight with them will be conventional, as most everybody assumes in Washington, D.C.? It's like the French thinking that the next fight with the Germans will be static line defensive attrition based warfare on the, you know, uh, where the Maginot Line is. The first rule of war and the new rules of war is that it won't be this. The future will not be conventional war. It's not going to be World War II with better technology. It's not going to be Tom Clancy, Red Storm Rising, all right? 
so conventional war is dead. It's very controversial. We'll talk about this in Q&A. Now in future conflicts, there might, be a high, there might be a moment of the conflict where there's high intensity conflict, conventional war type conflict, but it's not going to be the predominant character of future war. It will not be. It will be a, an element of it, but not exclusivity the way it was in World War II and World War I. Um, and this is not me coming up with this. There's nothing more unconventional today than a conventional war. Here is uh, social science data. It looks at wars since 1945 to 2015. Blue lines, the blue line represents sort of traditional conventional war, interstate conventional war. The red line is everything else. Nobody fights conventionally anymore these days. And this is conservative. There, there's conflicts on here like the Rwanda genocide. Was that war or not? Our narco thing, narco conflicts south of our border, are, is that conflict or criminality? Those are big questions, right? It's not even on there, some of these. So no one fights conventionally anymore except for us. But that's exactly what we're investing in. More, you know, docu, you know, it's a moral document, budgets. You could even ask this question. Are we already at war with Russia and China? And part of their strategy is to keep us to think that they're in we are at peace because you can exploit that for victory. All right? They think it's to some level they're at war with us. Maybe we should too. So what does war actually look like in this new emerging world order? It's actually it's an older world order. We're actually going back to a pre-Westphalian era. What does war look like? It's getting sneakier. War is getting sneakier. That's what war looks like. War is going from CrossFits to Sun Tzu, from, from strength to cunning. Here's some examples. They're Crimea. In the old rules of war, what did, when the Soviets wanted to bring a local state under its heel, what would it do? Let me tell me what it would do. It would invade with tanks, right? Think of Czechoslovakia 56, I'm sorry, Hungary 56, Czechoslovakia 68, right? Now, in the new, it fights the new rules of war, new global environment. What is, in 2014, they could have blitzkrieged into Ukraine, eastern Ukraine, and gone right to the Crimea. They had the, the, the military strength comparative to Ukraine to achieve that. But that's not what they did. What did they do? What did they do? Like, like they used, yeah, they, they did things like used like fake proxies, like the Donbass battalions, little green men, Spetsnaz special forces, mercenaries like the Wagner Group, a lot of active measures and propaganda. They used military means that gave them deception. They used covert means, right? They built the fog of war and exploited it for victory. So by the time policymakers were still scratching their heads back in the West and D.C., Crimea was already a fait accompli. All right? What did the, how did they do it? Well, first of all, we live in a global information age. And in a global information age, plausible deniability is more powerful than firepower. All right? We're investing in firepower. They're investing in plausible deniability which is exactly what special forces does, mercenaries do, little green men do, you know, proxy militia do, and active measures do. That's how they won. It wasn't about steel on target, it was about strategic deception. That's how they did it. Or how about this, the South China Sea? Old rules of war throw carrier groups into the South China Sea that will act as a deterrent against China. Is that working? not working. It is not working. And yet we still keep on doing it. It's the very definition of insanity. How are they winning? How is China winning the South China Sea without any carriers at all? They are. How are they doing it? Well, why are the islands important? Presence, sure. Territorial waters, deterrence, all these things, right? So what they're doing is they're doing strategic Aikido on us. You know Aikido, it's a Japanese martial art where you use the enemy's weight against them. 
So we have a strategic paradigm, our conventional war paradigm, that thinks of war like pregnancy. You either are or you're not, right? You are or you're not. Or think of it like a light switch. It's either on or off, on or off. And what they do is they get right, this is a false dichotomy, of course. They get right in between our headspace of war and peace, and they exploit that for victory. As any admiral will tell you, the US could take care of South China Sea in one afternoon. One afternoon. Just flip that light switch, we'll take care of it in one afternoon. Well, what, what China does deliberately, it goes right up to the brink of war, right up to where we'd flip that light switch, and then it stops. It stops. But guess what? It captures or keeps everything it creates. It captures it all. And this incremental gradual, this gradual incrementalism, done enough times, will yield them the salt trying to see one island and eventually one ally at a time. So the way they're winning is not with carrier groups. They're doing, they're, they're, they're messing with our strategic paradigm. They're, they're doing a keto on our, our own strategic paradigm because as one of the rules, the new rules of war, it's not war or peace, it's war and peace. And we've just forgotten this. We used to fight this way. Or how about this? <clears throat> mercenaries are coming back. They give you great plausible deniability. Here's a picture. We have mercenaries everywhere. Well, not we. The world's seeing a huge explosion of mercenaries in Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Nigeria, Venezuela, uh, all over the Congo, parts of, of like, you know, Libya. Mercenaries are everywhere. They're coming back. And they're not just lone dudes. These are organized, fairly professional, some of them fairly uh, adept warriors. Some are, some are not. <laughs> but um, the issue here, these are ex-SEALs and ex-Green Berets fighting in Yemen as a death hit squad for a Middle Eastern monarchy. Okay? The UAE hires a lot of them. Mercenaries are changing warfare because when you privatize war, it changes warfare where military strategy meets market strategy in ways that our four stars are not prepared for. There are market strategies for war, market strategies that, like Machiavelli would have known, like buying up all the enemy's mercenaries, bribing them, or <coughs> buying uh, mercenaries in a region to, 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 to re allow your enemy can't buy their own mercenaries to defend themselves. There are market strategies for war that CEOs might know about but generals do not. War is going backwards to this, to the oldest, second oldest profession, mercenaries. So in the future, victory goes to the cunning and the strong, and not just the strong. We are investing in strength. We need to invest in more cunning and military deception. So the global environment is changing. It is changing warfare, yet our systems you know, do not adapt to this, do not innovate to it. What we buy, how we train, et cetera, is not adapting to modern and future war. And that is why we struggle. That is why we wonder why things are not going our way sometimes, as it should. I call this strategic atrophy. Our tactical and operational intelligence is the highest in the world. Any country that would deign to confront us at the tactical or operational level will be annihilated. But at the strategic level, we're wanting. I'm not talking about flag officers, I'm talking about the, the entire US national security establishment. Right? That is what's lacking, strategic atrophy. So here's an example, here's war as we imagine it. This is things that we're investing in. This is something called, uh, it's a mechanical horse. I call it a robotic ass. Uh, basically, it's, it's, uh, it's meant to take soldier luggage around the battlefield. And um, we've, for $45 million and 10 years for this prototype, still a prototype after a decade, it only has three problems. It's pretty cool, but it only has three problems. One is that it can't go everywhere a soldier can go. Second is that if it breaks down in Iran, good luck getting apart. And third, it sounds like a lawnmower. Imagine that, being on patrol with a John Deere behind you, right? 
The truth is, is that a real ass or mule would be cheaper and better. But we fetishize technology, and it gets in the way of strategic innovation. Rule number two of the, the 10 new rules of war is that technology will not save us. Will not save us. We want technical solutions to war. War, at the end of the day, is armed politics. There's no technical solution to armed politics. And it's not just this thing, it's everything. So this, co this company is also making what I call like a T5, it's like a Terminator. I don't know what its uh, purpose is. I guess it lands into North Korea, the rampart goes down, and like hundreds of these guys flow out. Um, or the Ford class carrier, a new aircraft carrier. We already have the best aircraft carriers in the world, we're getting another one or two. They cost 13 billion a copy. 13 billion, that's, that's before you add soldiers, sailors, and aircraft to it, right? 13 billion, that's, does anybody know what SOCOM's budget is? 10 billion. SOCOM's budget is 10 billion, that, that's one ship, right? Or my, and it, frankly, also right now, at least, does not fly airplanes. Airplanes cannot launch off of it. It's just a big helicopter pad in the Pacific, I think. Um, or my favorite, or least favorite, uh, is the F-35. Now, the F-35, apologies to our Air Force uh, comrades, is a, it's an airplane. First of all, when was the last time there, were, there was a strategic dogfight? Let me know. Korean War, probably. You could argue some, maybe, Vietnam, but Korean War, generally, people will say. So one question is, do we need more fighter jets? Especially when we already have the F-15 and F-16, the best in the world, right? So this fighter jet is going to cost US taxpayers and allies, I'm going to take a guess how much this thing, the program costs. Trillion dollars, 10 billion, others. 45 what? 25 million. 25 million, all right. No, you're going to be an English major. Uh, oh, million, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Um, this costs 1.5 trillion, trillion dollars. Now, to give you some perspective on that number, which has a lot of zeros in it, that if this, if this airplane were a nation state, its GDP would be ranked 11th in the world ahead of Russia, ahead of Saudi Arabia, ahead of India, right? We're spending more on airplane than Russia's GDP. Think about that. It costs about the same as buying two, like, 767s. Do you know how much, how much does it cost to fly per hour? Anybody want to guess? It costs 10,000 an hour. What's that? 50,000. It costs about $45,000 an hour to fly. Now, in two long wars, how many combat missions has it racked up? Zero. Zero combat missions. Now, there was some, like a year ago, there was some sensitivity in parts of the Pentagon to this, so they, they flew a couple over Afghanistan, so they could say at least they got one or two in there. Um, but I'm an old grunt. If the enemy can't shoot back, it ain't a combat mission, right? Not a combat mission. So this thing is costing, and we're buying more of these things, buying more of them. Now they're great for like air shows, but uh, you know the the measure of any weapon's worth is its utility. And if they're not fighting wars, then what are they what are they doing, right? What are they doing? And we can go into hypotheticals, like well in the future we might need it, but it's all hypothetical now. Okay, it's all hypothetical. I'm a fiction writer. I know a lot about hypotheticals. It's all hypothetical. All right? That's war as we imagine it. Let's talk about war in reality. How is war fought and won in reality in the age of durable disorder? It's fought like this. Things like this. Russia trying to influence, you know, elections. And it's not just our election in 2016 and 18 and future ones, it's also the Brexit vote. It's uh, this past spring in elections across the EU. The IC, the Intelligence Committee, has unanimous uh, consensus around the fact that Russia is trying to influence our elections. 
the only question is, is how effective are they? Is, are they laughable, or did they swing a very close election? I don't know the answer to that, okay? But the strategic logic of this is compelling. The strategic logic is this. Who cares about the sword if you can manipulate the hand that wields it? That's strategic thinking for you. It has nothing to do with militaries or anything else. We have, we, we tacticize, we, our strategy, in my opinion, is that it's like the tacticization of strategy. We're all about, you know, uh, tactical and operational military art. And this is what war, wars are fought and won at the strategic level, and this is what strategic victory looks like in today. It's not a battle of, battle of Gettysburg or Waterloo or Stalingrad. That's the old ways of war. That's conventional war. That's not how wars end today or how they're won. Another is this, Russia doing military innovation. Here they are using a bomber, but not in a conventional sense. In the old rules of war, so the Soviets, the Russians, have always had a strategic objective to disunite Europe. That's always been a strategic objective of theirs. Now, in the old rules of war, in the Cold War, does anybody know what they might do to try to create friction inside NATO, for example? They would have these gigantic military exercises on the border of East and West, like Zapad 81. 150,000 Soviet troops in, you know, or, you know ba battle raid to come through the Fulda Gap and other gaps and take over you know, parts of Germany and multiple echelons, right? And what did they tell NATO? Relax, it's just a military exercise. But NATO didn't know. It could be a military ruse. And this would cause a lot of stress within the alliance. Now what does Russia do? When they want to, to, to break up or cause friction within the EU, they take a bomber, they bomb civilian centers in Syria. This creates an avalanche of refugees that go into Europe and it results in the Brexit. It results in the rise of right-wing national parties that want to break away from the EU across the European, all the countries there. The Soviets would have dreamed for st such strategic outcomes. So, this, so the Russians and the new rules of war weaponized refugees. They weaponized refugees, right? Can an F-35 fix that problem? No, it cannot. Well, it can shoot down the plane, I guess, so maybe you have me there. All right, another example. When was the last time anybody here saw a movie with China as the villain? Anybody? Don't say Red Dawn 2. It's a classic movie. How could they destroy a classic movie? Um, so the reason, it seems like an obvious villain, right? The reason is, is that China has legally bought most of Hollywood. They green light movies. And they're building their own Hollywood in China, which they hope to eclipse our Hollywood someday. So in an era where strategic influence decides winners and losers, they have just bought one of the biggest megaphones for strategic narrative in the world. And you cannot make a bad movie about China. So right here, war is becoming epistemological. In the old rules of war, battlefield victory determined winners and losers, like Napoleon, right? In the new rules of war, changing minds to telling truth from lies, that determines victory, not battlefield victory. And we're, we have challenges ahead of us if that's the changing character of war. So what does victory look like in this new type of warfare, in durable disorder? Well, it doesn't look like this. This is how conventional wars end. This is how Westphalian wars end. They have a peace treaty. Remember, you're war and peace, just war or peace. You stop the war, you have a peace treaty, everybody goes back to civilian until you know, somebody breaks the treaty. There's gonna be no USS Missouri moments with the Taliban, in my opinion. It's gonna look more like Vietnam, the Treaty of Paris, okay? It's not this, this is not how wars end in this new era of warfare. Victory will be an infinite game. 
It's going to be like a business cycle. You have some up quarters, you have some down quarters. But you're not going to have a quarter that decimates and annihilates the enemy once and for all. All right? Now, some might say, well, we, no, I don't believe that, or how could we possibly fight that way? But the truth is, we used to fight this way. We've just forgotten how. It was the Cold War. Was there war or peace in the Cold War? Was it even a war? Or was it, you know, or is it a metaphor? Well, if you talk to people who lived through it, they say it was a real war. And was there battlefield victory for this war? No, there wasn't, right? We've done all these things before, and we can do them again. We were very good at this. Just in the last 25 years, we've forgotten how. So the good news is we can still win. We've got to change our strategic aperture and then what we think about war and how we fight it. And to this end, I wrote this book. And it's a, it's a book to be read. It's a very accessible book. It reads like a magazine. It goes down easy like a novel. But it has real rigorous ideas behind it. And I offer 10 new rules, principles, ideas, I don't care what you call them, for war, about how to win, modern war. Rules one through four are things we have to stop doing. Rules five through 10 are things we have to start doing. The conventional warrior's head will explode upon reading these rules. That is, that is part of how China and Russia are winning, right? Now, some of these will be very controversial, especially rule number four. And I'll, it's hearts and minds do not matter, and I'll wait for somebody to ask that question. But on this note, I would like to turn it over to questions, and we're going to have a robust discussion about the new rules of war. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, uh, Cadet Venice yep. Company, B3. Um, what role do you think lobbyists have played in sort of keeping America in like this regressed state <laughs> and not keeping up? It's a great question. So I actually have um, one of the chapters in here, the uh, subchapter deals with Congress. And Congress, you know, basically in some cases forcing the military to buy weapons it doesn't want to buy. And, uh, and then once you have a weapon, there's a couple of problems. One is, the, the, what's the opportunity cost for things you're not buying that you need? And now we have this new weapon, and how are we going to use it in war? So we have means-driven strategy, right? Um, the truth is, is that the, the double helix of business interests and political interests form the DNA of our country that goes back to the founding of our republic. It was warned, our first warning was not Eisenhower, it was actually Teddy Roosevelt in the early 20th century who said, we need to get business out of, uh, of politics. And then Eisenhower comes back you know, 50 years later almost and says the exact same thing in his farewell address. And what's deeply ironic to me, uh, the guy who told us about the military industrial complex, is that if you look at the, our, our war college system, the war college that's dedicated to logistics and procurement, does that mean know what it's called? The Eisenhower School in Washington, D.C., exactly. He'd be rolling in his grave at our RPM. Um, so we, how do we fix that? I do not know. But I will say this, is that this, uh, the new rules of war has a lot of appeal for members of Congress because, frankly, a lot, of, a lot of members of Congress are tired of the DOD bill, right? And even members of DOD are like, oh my god, you know, uh, it's, it's the size of a small country. Um, and where is it all going? And, um, and you look at Lockheed and Raytheon, and are they, you know, in some ways, are they American oligarchs? Okay. Uh, I think you know, a robust discussion about what is the true civil-military relationship in our country. It's not just between the CGSC and the president. You have to figure in lobbyists and uh, Congress and business and everybody else as well. So I think um, I, I address this in the book, but I don't have a Harry Potter wand to fix I mean, that wouldn't even be the first thing I'd fix in Congress, probably you, you, as well. Uh, but in this, you know, could we, I mean, I, I just don't know if we could even get, you know, pa I don't think we could pass like a Goldwater Nichols type legislation in our current Congress. So uh, it's, a, it's a point of pessimism, but it shouldn't be a point of giving up. Next question, please. Sir Major yeah. Lovering, Department of History. Uh, why don't hearts and minds matter? 
Good question. I'm glad you asked this question. Uh, so in this rules one through four, uh, rule number four in the sort of the set of things to stop doing. In the chapter, I explain this, but in one bullet, you can't. So what this means is that in the, uh, you just heard me talk about like China and Hollywood. War is becoming epistemological. So at the strategic level, hearts and minds are supreme. Winning influence is supreme. And it's, it is an interesting question that how is a country that invented Hollywood and Madison Avenue get continually outfoxed with strategic communication? And there's some reasons for that are structural, historic, identity, and so forth. What rule number four is, is about, it's a critique of US counterinsurgency practice in Iraq and Afghanistan. And in my opinion, and may don't agree with this, but it was doomed from the beginning because it was, it was badly conceived. So in counterinsurgency or coin, the way the US practiced, it was largely lifted from a guy called David Galula. Has anybody heard of him? He's a French Tunisian officer in the middle of the 20th century who is trying to think about how do you defeat Mao? Because Mao was fighting, his Mao was sort of warfare, which is not exactly original. Looks a lot like this in some ways. And he can't, and, and the more conventional an army got against Mao, the more they lost. And so he came up with a strategy of how to defeat Mao. But his strategy was about re, it was reestablishing a colonial regime and not creating an independent nation state that was a democracy. And coin, we kind of took the best bits of coin that for our confirmation and selection bias rather than what he really meant. And it comes down to this. The way our coin worked, it's basically strategic bribery. Like, imagine this. China, China goes, anybody from here from Detroit? Okay, good. I'm just going to pick on Detroit a little bit. Totally arbitrary. Um, China goes to Detroit and says, look, we will give you free food. We'll give you free medical care, free schooling. Uh, we'll give you a subsidy for housing. We'll build you a football stadium. All you got to do is vote communist in your next congressional election, right? What would people of Detroit do? They'd say, I'll take all your stuff, but we ain't going commie, which is exactly what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. Populations are not bribable. And that's what coin theory, that's the strategic logic of coin theory, is you can bribe populations. If you give them enough services, they will give you their allegiance. That's not how it works. We have lots of literature on this going back to the Vietnam War that was ignored in 2007 and 8 due to confirmation and selection bias. Okay? And because it's, it, we, we engaged in ethnic mirroring. Basically, we thought like everybody has a democratic DNA, and if we just give them an option to live like us, they will choose it. But that's not how people work. Some people don't want to live like Americans. And you could say, well, it's false consciousness, but that's a very Marxist approach, actually. We start going down Marxist approaches. So our coin theory was flawed, in strategically flawed in some gargantuan ways. And if you really want to do coin, and I explain how you do coin in rule number four, it's bloody, it's amoral, and it's unethical. There are three ways you do coin, a combination. One is that it requires a lot of blood. You just go and you massacre people. Think of the, the Romans against the Judeans in 68 AD, OK? Human rights violations galore. Uh, the, the second thing you do is you do an import model. You import your own people into their homeland so that they become a minority in their own homeland. Think of like China, what's doing to Tibet. And the second is, the third is you do export. So this is where you take their, their people out of their homeland and you spread it across other places. You relocate them, which is what Stalin did to Chechens in World War II with Operation Lentil, right? To do it really well, you do all three at once, which is how the US settled the West in the 19th century. From using the US Army to settle West, using the Trail of Tears to relocate and to, to create you know, railways to get immigrants into the hinterlands. That's what coin requires. It doesn't look like the unicorn rainbow version as was briefed in Capitol Hill. I know that's what was not going on in Iraq. But the way it was briefed in Capitol Hill was like, oh, it's just going to, we're going to give them choices. They'll choose us. It'll be happy ever after. So rule number four is at the tactical level, coin as we practiced it, it does not work. But in the new rules of war, 
winning hearts and minds is supreme. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Edward Sobies from the Army Cyber Institute. Uh, yeah. First of all, I just want to affirm how much I love the book and Thank you. have been recommending it for months. So nice to have you to come up here. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk. Um, you talked in a little bit about you know all the things America does wrong, and yeah. you you cited some things that Russia and China have done right. Yeah. My question is, could you share with us anything that you see China and Russia doing wrong? Yeah. Good question. Ba Okay, so I, I've, I've used, I've talked about uh, critiquing the American way of war so that we might improve it. We do some things really well. I would say that we did some things really, really well in the Cold War that we've forgotten how to do. I give an example of, it's a very controversial example of Guatemala 54, okay? Now, the, is anybody familiar with Guatemala 1954? Basically, it's a very controversial case study uh, about the reasons about how basically the CIA organized you know, a, a regime change in Guatemala using sort of these types of rules, <laughs> all right? And we've done it before. Now, the, the reasons for doing Guatemala and what happened after Guatemala are very problematic, and I'm being very upfront with that. But the point is, is that we have used deception before, okay? Um, we look at ourselves, we're a democracy, we, we're an open society, we're vulnerable to others influencing our elections, right? I mean, we all know democracy is messy. And you know, if, if we're having, right now, many would say we're in the middle of a culture war in our country. And that's all well and good if it's just in the house squabbling to figure out our soul. But it's not good if foreign powers are manipulating and fanning the flames of dissent, which I think they are. You know, and I would put that up someplace in the spectrum of warfare, right? Now, is it technically war? We can, that's a different discussion. So we think like, oh, just in this new era, we are at a disadvantage because we have elections and we know that if war is getting sneakier from things like the Church Commission from 1975, 76, some of you will read about this. We all know from that time period that secrets and democracy do not mix. All right, so how do we follow war into the shadows and not lose our democratic soul, all right? Now, here's where we can punch back. And I talk about this in rule number nine. I call it shadow war. It's not exactly a regular war. It's something a little different, uh, but it's in the vein of IW. Uh, it is this, is that autocracies are even more vulnerable than we are, okay? Autocracies centralize power amongst an elite who make all sorts of decisions. And, you know, we can get in there and basically screw with that. Okay, that's, the, that's the, not the technical academic term. That's the 11 Bravo term. But you know what I'm saying, right? Like, we can get in there, if we could, and we've done this before in the Cold War, if we could manufacture the perception of dissent within an oligarch or an autocrat's inner lieutenant ranks, and he wipes out half of them for us, good for us, right? Um, if you wanna take China out of the South China Sea, you don't throw in carrier groups, you support the Uyghurs. Get them interested in their own regime security and they will withdraw from the South China Sea by themselves. Same with Syria and Russia. Russia in 2015, the first time since the Cold War, did an expeditionary military operation in the Middle East. Is the way to go in there to send our own like soft to, to do you know, black on black? Well, that's, that doesn't get you very far. The way to really get them out is to, is to do what you did during the Cold War. You, you support regimes on their border who do not like Moscow, right? Moscow is definitely afraid of color revolutions. Why don't we engineer a few? Some would say we're already doing it. I'd say we'd do it better. There's something else we could do. We have the best universities in the country, in the world, right? The elite of China, the, the sons and daughter of elite in China all want to study at Stanford and other places. Let's deny them that. Go study in University of Hanoi, right? So they go back to mom and pop and say, will you stop doing this stuff against the Uyghurs in South China Sea? You go, Let them carry the water for us. I am not saying blanket pro proscription against all Chinese students in America. I'm talking about like smart sanctions, smart like visa things. Like if you're the son or daughter of one of the elite in China who is in charge of foreign policy, 
let's, you know, they can bring in the, the message for you. There's many things that we can do, but they're, they're not conventional war things. Uh, and we should be, and, and dealing with strategic influence is a different question, because we have things like the Smith-Monk Act and things that you know, prohibit us from doing strategic communication. These laws and other structures were written in a pre-internet age. We need to update them. Next question. Sir, Roy Ragsdale, Army Cyber Institute. Yeah. So uh, state of durable disorder sounds somewhat pessimistic. Uh, yeah. you know, there's kind of another vein of thinking from folks at like the Gapminer Institute and Hans Rosling in his book, Factfulness. Yeah. And you kind of point to statistics like income and medical and education and say, by and large, the world's way better than you think it is and uh, improving a lot, a lot across a lot of dimensions. You know, how would you uh, square those two? Well, first of all, it's not meant to be pessimistic. It's meant, durable disorder is meant to be an observation without judgment. Uh, we know for a while now that uh, you know, nation states have been in retreat for the last, last 25 years. That's not controversial to say that, all right? Um, the question is what's left in their wake is a big question. We are taught that nation states are timelessly universal, but uh, that's actually not true. They're only a few hundred years old. Um, most places in the world are durable disorder. I, I lived and worked in Africa for several years. Those maps, our grid lines, are mostly imagination. The, the state boundaries of most states in Africa were settled by European colonialists in the 1880s that do not reflect polities on the ground. Same with the Middle East. The, the boundaries of states in the Middle East, they don't reflect, reflect actual polities. That was, that, came, that was mostly derived between Sykes and Picot in 1916, right? And one of the first things that ISIS did in 2014 was ceremonially bulldoze down the border between Iraq and Syria, saying this, is, this was an import, I mean, uh, you know, from Europe, made by non-Arabs. Uh, and so these, and some have even argued that those borders help foster conflict in those regions. So I don't, I don't think it's necessarily pessimistic to say that, you know, the world has tried on the cloak of European colonial boundaries and finds it wanting, right? Um, some would say life is good, but I would really test that, the rigor of that analysis. Because when I lived in, like, in parts of the Congo or Western Europe, I'll tell you, their Bureau of Labor and Statistics ain't too good. So where are they drawing this data from? Mostly, you know, first world countries, right? So they, I just don't know, like, how do you, tell, tell, how do, what's the average income of somebody in Somalia or the Central African Republic or Syria these days? Well, I don't know. They don't know either. And I'd push back on their data set saying, show me. Show me how you got with those ones and zeros. How do you, you know, so I, I um, you know, Steve Pinker also, The Better you know, Angels of Our Nature, I mean, a very controversial book, saying, but how, how do you tell me what, uh, I mean, there's a lot of statistical data problems that are baked into data sets that people, so there's a number on it, we have this bias that it's rigorous. I would open up those, you know, I look for cause correlation, I look for selection bias, confirmation bias, things like that. So I don't have, you know, I, don't have, I, I haven't looked at their specific set, but, I have a, I'm generally skeptical about this, but this is also not meant to be um, pessimistic. I'm, I'm an observer of war. I see war trending in this direction. I'm like, I'm trying to be like Billy Mitchell and saying, hey, we should trend with it, that's all. Yeah, next question. Sean, I'll go to uh, rule number one. Yeah. So I just want to walk the dog on it. If you say conventional yeah. war is dead, do you mean conventional forces are dead? Ah, good question. So in rule number one, I don't argue that we should scrap all conventional forces. Because as soon as we do, guess who would start investing in them, right? Our enemies, right? I'm just saying we don't need $13 billion boats anymore. That's all, all right? We don't need F-35s. We already have the best conventional forces in the world. Let's work on these, some of these other things. Like rule number five, some of the best weapons do not fire bullets, right? So let's think about how we should conduct modern like diplomacy. If I could write another book on this topic, it would be the new rules of diplomacy, 
because I would argue our State Department is mired as much in the 19th century as parts of our military are. Um, but I, I think that the, the point of rule number one is, uh, first of all, deterrence doesn't really work anymore. Has anybody notice this? Maybe I'm wrong, but the question of what does deterrence look like in the 21st century? Because we have all these forces, and is it, is it curbing you know, Iran, Tehran, Moscow, Beijing? I don't think it is. You could argue, we could have that discussion, but it's not having the same effect as it once did, all right? And certainly things like ISIS, and you know, it doesn't, de doesn't deter them at all, I don't think. So what does deterrence look like, and if it's de does deterrence come out out of conventional forces? So I think that w what I'm arguing is that we should rebalance the force. We don't need any more big conventional war weapons. I think we're already pretty good with that. I would also do some radical things. I would, we, you know, right now, like in our reserves, we have the combat arms are on active duty and combat service support, et cetera, is on reserve. I would flip those around. Very controversial, I know. But if you think about what are the forces that we, what are the people we've had, what skills do we need a lot of, a lot of them are in the reserves. Whereas how many you know, tank divisions have been sent into you know, places that we need them? It's a question mark. Also, why, do, why are chiefs of staff, they, they profile very similarly, right? Uh, the army chief of staff is usually what? What branch is he from? Infantry, right? Maybe we should have an intel guy or gal. Or, you know, just, I'm trying to, I think we should, ways to break up the culture. Uh, so it's not just, um, you know, in, in the Air Force, it's usually, what, a fighter pilot? And the Navy, it's usually a submarine driver or a fighter pilot. A Marine is just a Marine, right? Uh, uh, I mean, th but the, the idea of it is how do we change strategic culture? Because there's a saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Sir, it seems like the military is kind of uh, poorly suited as an institution to deal with some of these problems. You've talked about budgetary constraints, our history, our inability to fight uh, looking forward. What institutions in America maybe are better suited? Is there something like a Silicon Valley or yeah, the other market forces or something we're not thinking of yeah. that can be more maneuverable and address these issues? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, I, my message is not that the military is ill-suited to this. I think the military is a divided house. Right, it's not a monolithic hole. I think there are elements of the military that want to go and fight, sort of like uh, you know, they want, you know, the, the, they want to like uh, they want they want to fight a battle of midway with four class carriers and F 35s in South China Sea. And there's another part of the military that don't want to do that. So I think that this is a conversation that's going on inside the military. I've I've been asked to give this talk a lot within the military. And sometimes people pull me in because I can say things that they don't officially want to say, right? But there's a lot of discussion of, about these ideas. Um, getting to your larger point about other, other institutions, I mean, it's very difficult given our political environment right now in Washington, D.C., right? Uh, and that might be part of the play of our adversaries who are trying to fuel some of this. We are so focused on well, you know, look at any headline any day, right? That we kind of are, are missing some of the bigger pictures. I think one of the questions that I have, I have, and I've asked this of my colleagues here at Modern War Institute, is how do you create a great strategist? You know, because I think we've been more lucky than smart. If you look at George C. Marshall. I think George Marshall's one of the very best generals in the history of the United States of America. He's not the most celebrated general, but he was a real strategic thinker. How did we get him? Or Abraham Lincoln, who was actually a great strategic thinker. If you look at his CV, there's nothing in his background that seems obvious that he'd be qualified for that job. But you know, he, he, he thought strategically about a war. Um, I don't think we do a good job at creating strategic thinkers. I think the war college system we have is a little bit moribund. I would agree with Mr. Mattis about this. Um, I think civilian institutions are worse. I think, you know, top universities, there's some amazing individuals at, at certain places, and there's some amazing pockets within that world. But right now, when, you know, we have a commander in chief, you know, what do they learn these things, right? I mean, that's a bigger question. So, I, you know, are there institutions doing this? I don't think that there are. But I think we can learn from other countries. So, for example, has anybody here read China's three warfare strategy, right? So there's, right now, as you all know, in Washington, D.C., 
there is like real expertise and there's like de jour expertise. De jour expertise means that some talking head, like three years ago, they were an ISIS expert. And then two years before that, they were a Russia expert. And then two years before that, they were an Al Qaeda expert. Like, they don't really have expertise. And now China's the same way. I have China expertise, but I don't speak Mandarin, uh, stuff like that. Um, so there's a lot of people who talk about China, but they don't even read China's basic strategic document. So the three warfare strategy is China's, one of the national security strategy documents. It's open, you can read it, it's online. And here are the three warfares, how they plan to kick out us from their region you know, in the near future, probably like say 2049. Warfare one, information warfare. Think of China buying Hollywood, think of CCTV, think of all that. Number two, lawfare. Lawfare is a way to undermine international rule of law uh, and use countries' rule of law against them to stymie up things. And the third is economic power. One, one Belt, One Road initiative. Look at Sri Lanka. They, they got Tony Soprano out of their biggest prize port yeah, the, in China. That's it. There's no fourth warfare for military. We have a lot to learn from our adversaries. And so I would look, doesn't mean we have to imitate them. It doesn't mean we have to become them. But we should at least deign to read what they're putting out and seeing if it's working and how we might adopt that. that. Yeah. The last question. Yeah. Being from the Army Cyber Institute, I would be remiss if I didn't call you out and ask you to discuss a little bit thoughts on cyber. Yes. The, coming age of AI and other emerging technologies. Okay, and yes, I'm glad that you did. So um, in rule number two, I discuss cyber. And I will say up front that I'm a cyber skeptic. And I think the reason I say that is because the signal to noise ratio in the cyber discussions is pretty outrageous in my opinion. There are really ex expert opinions that get drowned out by the garbage opinions, all right? Now, cyber, um, there's a couple things I don't talk about in detail in this book. <clears throat> one, one is like space war and nuclear war because they're really hypothetical. We don't know what either of those really, even after nuclear war, 70 years, we still don't know exactly what that looks like. Limited nuclear war versus you know, Armageddon nuclear war. And space war, if you, if you go to conferences, it's mostly about our bureaucracy, how to organize for it rather than the, you know, what does it look like, a space battle, right, or space whatever. Uh, cyber war, I, I, I kind of put in the same camp, and I'll tell you why. Part of it is a signal noise ratio. Part of it is that our, in my opinion, in, a, in Washington, D.C., the, the, the most influential opinions about cyber don't come from cyber experts, they come from Hollywood, all right? So think of things like, uh, um, like that movie, that James Bond movie, Skyfall, where every time a hacker touches a keyboard, they become a god. You know, that's not what real hacking is like. Real hacking is generally pretty boring, I think. Um, also, I don't think that the power of cyber is not in sabotage, like Stuxnet. It's in influence, like we're seeing now. Um, and I think we need to invest in how do we make Americans better and savvier consumers of information. And the solution can't be generational, like better education. The solution has got to be something like, well, you know, you know, clickbait. You know, the problem with clickbait, you click on something and people, well, what if we we all have clothes that say has, has a label where our clothes are made? What if we did something similar for clickbait? This clickbait's made in Iran. This clickbait's made in North Korea. Ways technology to help Americans become savvier consumers of information. Um, but cyber writ large, I mean. I, if you ask cyber experts, and I, you know, I, I'm saying this advisedly because there are cyber experts in, in this room uh, and up here, is that a lot of cyber experts say, well, what is cyber? And they'll say it's like ones and zeros in space, right? Or is cyber, is it information or is it just a channel for information? And then suddenly war becomes like, what does cyber war really look like? Uh, and then people, and the thing that kind of I find to be tiresome is the old trope of, well, a hacker could shut down all the electricity in the eastern seaboard. And it's like, okay, show me, right, show me. And nobody can, so it's top secret. You know, it, it gets to be, it's like when the CIA in the 70s said, well, we, our victories are so many, we just can't tell you. It's a, sort of the boy cries wolf, right? And I, I think, you know, and I kind of make a little bit of fun of this in the book that, 
in reality, if you want to look at what causes blackouts, it's not cyber activists, it's squirrels. Squirrels cause more blackouts than, uh, than cyber activists. But it's, you know, we don't have like rodent warfare. We don't call a new warfare after it. So I, you know, I, I'm, I want to see cyber focus. Um, uh, and I, I think that the power of cyber is it's a channel of information that can influence people in ways that matter in the new rules of war. Is it a new domain of war? I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a deeper question. Uh, I, I don't know if I agree it should be a fifth domain of war. But, um, but that might be the next book, like, uh, like, you know, this for, or rules like 11 through 15 or something like that. So it's a, it's a good question. Well, thank you very much. I hope uh, the idea of, this, of the book is that it, it opens up questions. It doesn't necessarily resolve them, but to make us think differently about the future of war so that we don't get caught behind our own Maginot line. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. West Point, thank you for kicking off the uh, speaker series. Thank you. I'd like to uh, hand over to a, a highly desired and rarely given Modern War pen, and well. only because you're able to work in a <laughs> quote from Monty Python. <laughs> <in your talk. laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you much. I appreciate it. Thank you.